Welcome to the Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. The following chapter is taken from a book called Trouble of Mind and the Disease of Melancholy by Timothy Rogers, who lived from 1658 to 1728. This chapter is called Present Distress of Conscience is No Sign of Reprobation. There may be too great trouble for sin, and when it is excessive, former experiences may be helpful to afflicted people. Do not judge your eternal state by what you now feel. You may, by the terrors of the Lord, be in anguish and tribulation in the very suburbs of hell, and yet never go there. God may be displeased, and yet, after a moment's sorrow, you may find him to be your gracious and everlasting friend. You may be now thrown down, but his hand and his promise can quickly raise you up again. You may conclude, through the power of your dismal thoughts, that you are reprobates, and yet God may bring you to salvation at the end. You may lie in terror for many years, but you cannot, you ought not to say, that it will be so forever. I myself have been so afflicted, in such great anguish and perplexity, under such dreadful apprehensions of the wrath of God, and of his power and greatness employed against me, as I thought, that I thought myself in hell, thinking of it as not so much a place, but as a state. I thought that my soul would be gathered with sinners, and that I would be found at the left hand of Christ. I thought that I was cut down forever, banished from the courts and from the presence of the Lord, and should never see light, comfort, or refreshment any more. Yet through the grace of God, you see that I am revived and that I am not without hope as I once was. From the very gates of death, from the very door of destruction, I have come to tell you that though God is just, yet he is also gracious. There is mercy with him that he may be feared. And as the night comes, so will the morning also, for though we have provoked him, which was our folly, Yet he will not contend forever, which is our comfort. Psalm 31, verses 21 to 24. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried to thee. O love the Lord, all ye saints. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your hearts, all ye that hope in the Lord. When you are in deep and sore affliction, such as smarts and makes us groan, it is hard indeed to believe that what makes us so sick will promote our health, or that what breaks us in pieces will join our bones again. But our sense and present feeling are not to guide our thoughts. We feel ourselves indeed to be miserable, But we ought to believe that our present misery may promote our happiness, though by ways that for the present we may not see. We are not to judge God by the darkness of his providences, but by the light of his word. Not by his afflicting strokes only, but by his promise, which obliges him to correct us for our sin, but yet ought altogether to destroy us. Remember that it is an evil thing to be overly troubled, even for sin itself. This advice does not concern the greatest part of mankind. Most are secure, breaking the laws of God and not trembling. They pollute themselves with manifold abominations and are not ashamed. They sin with lofty looks and hardened hearts and do evil with both hands earnestly. They take the name of God in vain. They profane his Sabbaths. They slight his word. They defy his threats. And they scorn as messengers, yet few or none strike their thighs and ask, What have we done? They are daring where they ought to fear, and rejoice where they ought to mourn. The greatest part of the world are in a deep slumber, in misery and danger. But they are sensible. They do not know that the end of these things will be very bitter and vexatious. But I am now speaking to those whose consciences are awakened, 
with a sense of the greatness, majesty, and justice of God and the strictness and holiness of his law, and who have at the same time a deep sense of their own guilt and liability to condemnation. Their thoughts in such troubles are too much apt to sink and to be overwhelmed. Indeed, the view of all their sins set in order before them is too terrible for them to look upon. The burden and the weight of them is too heavy for any mortal man to bear. But they should consider that God is not only severe, but very good. That he is not only angry, but reconcilable and willing to be at peace again. This will represent his love toward us. And it is that, and that alone, which will melt our hearts with a kindly grief and keep our sorrow from overflowing the due bounds as it is very prone to do. And it does so in several cases. The first case is when our sorrows for sin hinders our regular proceeding in the true judgment of things. We know that in dark and cloudy seasons we cannot distinctly perceive the various objects that we clearly discern in fair weather. So when our sorrows have raised a mist before our eyes, we obscure our reason and weaken our faculties. We do not see things as they really are, but as they appear in a dark and confused manner. When we are not able to apprehend things as they are in themselves, but as our afflictions represent them, that is a false medium in which to form our judgments. They make us heighten our troubles, and it may be make them greater than they really are. Moreover, they make us altogether inattentive to those directions, methods, and advices that are suggested for our help. Second, when our sorrow for sin drives us away from God, the sight of our wounds should make us hasten to the great physician for speedy relief. When I thoroughly beheld my sin, the next thought should be, Oh, what need I have for God to forgive me, for a Savior to plead my cause, and for the Holy Spirit to renew me. What need I have to throw myself at the feet of him whom I have provoked? I need to say in the submissive terms of the poor prodigal, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But because I have once wandered, I am not still to wander in a strange country far from my proper home. Our grief for sin is too great when it causes us to totally despair to give ourselves over as hopeless and lost forever. This we ought never to do. We weep too much when we cannot see the goodness and mercy of God as well as his justice and severity. When we think that it is good to him that he should oppress and crush the works of his own hands. When we judge him to be tyrannical and cruel, as if he intended nothing but our ruin. When we peremptorily say that he will not hear our prayers, nor show us any favor, when we have no suitable thoughts of his amiable nature, his covenant and his promise. We weep too much for sin when by the painfulness of the rod we call into question all that he has ever done for us, when, because he frowns, we say that he has thrown us off, when because he delays his help, we say that he will be gracious and favorable no more when we charge him foolishly and either deny his providence or blame his conduct, because he does not use as gentle a method as we would have him take, or when from our distress we draw desperate conclusions regarding him or ourselves. Most of all, we weep too much for sin when we see others, whom we reckon to be as great sinners as ourselves, to be in health and peace, while we groan and languish and say that we have cleansed our hearts in vain, Psalm 73, verse 11, that it is a vain thing to be religious, to fear such a God who allows his servants to be so very much afflicted, and with such sorts of sorrows that are more spiritual, and consequently more bitter than the rest of the world is acquainted with. Third, we are too much troubled for our sins when that trouble not only indisposes us for duty, for if it is attended with pain and trouble, it will be apt to do so. But when it makes us altogether omit our duty that we owe to God, when our sorrows dampen our affections, which are the wings of our souls, to carry us up to God, when they cause us to mind nothing else but what is sad and grievous, 
when her sorrow swells to so great a height that it covers with its imperious waves all the foundations and grounds of peace and comfort. It was not so, as some have observed, with our blessed Lord. When he was upon the cross, he was in extreme pain and in violent agonies. Yet these did not take away from him his care for his mother. The good thief, in the midst of his pangs, labored to gain his fellow thief and save his own soul and to glorify Christ. These were extraordinary instances. Our sickness may be such that all that we can perform for God is a quiet submission to his will and a desire for the prayers of others. So our sorrows for sin are excessive when they make us give up praying, hearing, or the like duties. When they unstring our harps, dull our praises, or make us unfit for our calling. The fourth case is when our sorrow puts us upon indirect means for relief. When we put that trust in men that should be placed in God. When we expect that cure from them which he alone is able to give. When we seek relief in vain company, in recreations, or in the things of this world. But if our sense of God's displeasure is very great, we soon know that all these things are of no value. Call to mind those experiences that you have heretofore had of the goodness of God. Remember the years when you have known the right hand of the Most High. You are now fearing his wrath. But can you not remember the time when his love was your daily solace and delight? You are now complaining that he does not hear your cry. But how many prayers has he sent back with a gracious answer? How many times have you lain at his feet in humiliation and tears and his hand has wiped your tears away? How many times when you have been fainting has his word revived your poor troubled souls? And though his word is now bitter to your taste and fills you with gall and wormwood, yet it is still able to revive you. Those places of scripture that heretofore revived you are still able to refresh you. Those breasts are still as full of consolation as they ever were, but you are for the present under a decay of spirits and have lost your appetite so that you cannot draw that consolation from there that you used to do. Do not forget the many mercies of your infancy, your childhood, your youth, and your riper age. Do not forget how seasonable, how unexpected, how necessary your mercies have been, both for your bodies and your souls. And though I know it is your abuse of them that grieves and troubles you, yet remember that he who once forgave you can forgive you still and that he who once did so much good is still able to do you good. Paraphrasing Judges 13.23 If the Lord had meant to destroy us, he would not have received a sacrifice at our hands, nor have done all this for us. Shall we distrust? Shall we forsake? Shall we limit a God who has been heretofore so very merciful and so gracious? And though it is very true that it is no comfort to a poor man to think that he was once rich, or to a sick man to think that he was once in health, for the bitterness of his present evil takes away the relish of his former comforts. And when a man has lost God and his terrible apprehensions, it seems more intolerable than if he had never enjoyed him. Yet having once had communion with him by his grace and by his spirit, may give us some reason to hope that the root of the manor is in us and that God will cause it to bud and spring forth again, though it now lies under water and is covered with many storms and tribulations. And I may also add it may be covered with many sins and corruptions with which we were not troubled before. Remember that God will not judge you according to what you are in such a woeful distemper as that of melancholy, but that it will go with you as you were in the time of your health. This is highly necessary to be considered for many good people when they are under the disease of melancholy, which can no more be prevented than tuberculosis or a fever, are very apt to express themselves after this or a similar manner. I thought I had once been serious, but now I see that it was all a deceit. I see that I heard and prayed and received the sacraments in vain. For if I had been a true believer, this would never have befallen me. This is a very false way of arguing. For if you had 
been never so sincere that sincerity would not have kept away diseases, nor this one in particular. For in melancholy we think and speak according to our present apprehensions and fears, and these are greatly caused by the disorder of our imaginations, which is owing to the confusion and the hurry of our thoughts. And that confusion is a product of a great and unusual stagnation or fixing of the spirits. When the blood is corrupted and the body indisposed, and this is most frequently occasioned by the want of rest or sleep. It is commonly said by others who do not know what melancholy is. Why do you think and pour so much? Divert yourself, think of something else, but it is no more possible for people where this disease comes with violence to divert their thoughts than it is possible for a man to be alert in an apoplexy or calm in a raging fever. No more than a man who has a broken arm or leg can walk and act as he used to do before. As Richard Baxter says in his Christian directory, rational and spiritual methods will not suffice to cure this. For you may as well expect that a good sermon or comfortable words will cure epilepsy, palsy, or a broken head simply because this disease works on the spirits and fantasy on which words of device also work. Therefore, such words in Scripture and reason may somewhat resist it, or may palliate or allay some of the effects at present, but as soon as time is worn off to force and effects of these reasons, the distemper immediately returns. And it is as natural for a melancholy person to fear and to meditate on terror as it is for a sick man to groan or for one in health to breathe. It is certain that tenacious, obstinate distempers such as this one of melancholy, will not be relieved by mere words or sentences. They cannot indeed cast out their troubled thoughts. They cannot turn away their minds. They can think of nothing but what they do think. Just a man with a toothache cannot forbear to think of his pain. To not so think is to be cured, which they would be glad to be. Though others urge us to rule our thoughts, it gives us no relief, but only adds to our misery to be frequently urged to do that which we cannot do. But my advice to such is that, in the use of such things as they find to yield a natural refreshment to their spirits, they would look up to God, who can make the winds and storms cease, and make that unquiet agitation that is in the blood and humors be still again. And when he shall be pleased to give you the rest of night and the clearness and activity of your natural spirits, then your troublesome and uneasy thoughts by the help they will then receive by reading or advice will wear away. I speak nothing but what I myself have experienced to be true, for this disease magnifies our sorrows. What I am aiming at is this. When any are in deep melancholy, so far as they have any reason left, they should not increase their own terror by thinking that all their former prayers and endeavors have been to no purpose, because they do not perceive at that time what effect they have had. God is certainly more gracious than to reckon the unavoidable attendance of a disease that none but himself can cure, to be a sin. Men are not to be judged by what strange actions or expressions they are guilty of in a violent sickness, and among all diseases that are so. I think this is one of the most violent. Chapter 12 The very sins that God has in allowing his servants to be under long affliction, spiritual distress, and anguish. Consider what ends God may have in letting the apprehensions of his wrath continue for a season. Here I know I am entering upon a thing in which we cannot have a certain comprehensive knowledge, for the judgments of God in great, long, and severe trials are too deep for us to easily fathom or to tell particularly what God's design is in this or that manner. The arcana of his government are not obvious to everyone who desires to pry into them. And there is an abundance of very dark and mysterious providences in this world, the reasons for which we shall never know till the great day. Who can tell the very cause why God allows one religious man to be in affliction for several years, while another who is perhaps no better than he, scarcely knows what affliction means. One shall be cross and disappointed in all that he goes about. He meets with losses in his estate and in his family, and his health is damaged, while another prospers as well and dies an easy death. And what a smooth path do some good people go to heaven, 
while others are torn with thorns and briars and go mourning and weeping all the way. Who dares to presume to say why this is so and not otherwise? A great modesty should become us in our inquiries when we endeavor to pierce into the designs of the great God, whose throne is established in righteousness, but surrounded with clouds and darkness. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, Proverbs 25, verse 2. His infinite majesty will not be accountable to us for what he does. There is a thick veil upon the reasons for his judgments and decrees, so that he may procure greater veneration from his creatures. Psalm 77, verse 19. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Therefore, when we say that God does this or that for such and such a reason, we must do it with great humility, and only so far as the scripture is our guide. And from that we may learn that God allows his people to be under the apprehensions of his wrath and under long afflictions for such ends as these. First, it is certainly good for the universe, for God does nothing in vain. And when any part suffers, it is for the good of the whole. We may not be able to discern how it may be so, though until his hand has finished his entire design. Number two, he does this so that others may be convinced by their very senses what a dreadful God he is and how terrible a thing it is to sin. The lion has roared, who will not fear? Amos 3 verse 8. When we see those who were once as pleasant as themselves shedding tears and crying out in the bitterness of their souls that they are undone and miserable, their sad looks and their doleful expressions bear witness to the being and to the severity and justice of God, sometimes in the extraordinary joys which his love produces in the hearts of his people. He shows heaven upon earth, and sometimes in the fears, amazements, and terrors of awakened consciences, he shows hell upon earth, and both are designed for the good of others by his wise and holy providence. The language of their groan speaks to all who behold their sorrow. Who do not sin against so great and so terrible a God, lest the flames begin to scorch you that have almost consumed us. We no more thought of falling into his hands than you do. We no more thought our sinning would cost us so dearly than you do. But you see what we have felt, and what you may expect if you do not repent and turn and make your peace with so holy a God as he is. His power will amaze you. His arm will crush you if ever you provoke him to send on you such a stroke as ours is. Endeavor, therefore, to profit from such a sorrowful example. Number three. God does it to keep us from carnal security all our lives. Psalm 9, verse 20. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. When our sin has fallen upon us like a giant who is newly refreshed with wine, surely the remembrance of that horror, pain, and smart will keep us so that we shall not dare to sleep in sin nor be unwatchful and presumptuous any more forever. Surely this will quench all irregular desires and cause us only to desire that God whose favor we need so very much. This has surely shown us how great our weakness and our folly are, and how low we sink when we think that he has left us. This will make us be humble and walk softly all our days, remembering that we are not every hour any more than what God makes us to be. If he ever left us, for but one poor moment, where would we be? We who have tasted so much of his displeasure have cause to rejoice with trembling. Every remembrance of that doleful time must be to us as a new motive to obedience and a powerful restraint of sin. Hebrews 12.10 He chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Oh, what an abundance of folly must have been lodged in our hearts that God is forced to use so sharp and severe a method to whip it out. How numbed were we that nothing else could awaken us? How diseased were we that nothing but a potion so bitter could promote our cure? How great was our pride that he was forced to beat it down by so violent a stroke? Deuteronomy 8, verse 15 and 16. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, that he might humble thee and prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end? And so it was that Paul had a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Number 4. God does this to convince us of his own all-sufficiency and the nothingness of ourselves and of all other creatures. He lets us fall to show us how small our strength is and that if we would have our goings established, we must depend upon him alone. 
In our prosperity, we are apt to think that this or that creature, this or that person will yield us relief. But in spiritual troubles, God shows us that all men, even the best of men, are vanity, and those from whom we expect the greatest help do us the least good. Nay, those watchmen of whose skill and kindness we have the greatest opinion are frequently allowed to smite us by their imprudent or harsh speeches and censors, so that we may not look to those cisterns which we find to be broken ones, but to that heaven whence all our consolation flows. When we go to created things with the most raised expectations, we meet with the most unlooked-for disappointments, and indeed while we look only to them we are like people who go begging to the doors of the poor. Our fellow creatures have nothing but what they receive, unless God helps us they cannot help either. Unless the wind blows, neither all the skill of the pilot nor all the industry of the mariner can make the ship sail forward to the port. We think that if our friend was sick, we would hasten to his help and immediately relieve him, but our best friend stays a long while before he delivers us, not from any pleasure that he takes in our sorrows, but that he may render his power and his wisdom more illustrious. Thus it was with Christ in John eleven six and 7. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days in a place where he was so that the glory of God might be more conspicuous in Lazarus' resurrection. And when the season that is most beautiful comes, we shall discern the reason for his delay. He lets us fall low so that he might display his power that is almighty and his wisdom that is never at a loss, so that it, we might know when all other methods have been tried in vain, that it is he alone who can make our broken bones rejoice that when we are beset with difficulties which we think insufferable, we may still stand and see how glorious, how suitable, and how speedy is the salvation, the grace, and the help of God, and that he alone is the God of comfort, Second Corinthians 1, verse 3. He wants us to see that all other things are inconsiderable, but that he is all-sufficient. It is an excellent lesson that he teaches us by our heaviest crosses. None can calm the tumults and uneasiness of a troubled soul but he alone. Our spirits are so remote from human observation. Our diseases are so inward and so great that men cannot reach them, but nothing is too hard for him who is a father of spirits. And he calls us peculiarly to regard this as his mighty work, Isaiah 57, verses 17 to 19. For the iniquity of his covetousness I was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. God creates peace. He not only brings peace, but he brings it from nothing by his all-powerful efficacy, so that nothing can resist. I say again, this I believe to be one of the principal lessons that God designs to teach us by our inward and spiritual troubles, that in Him alone our help lies, and that even the best of men are vanity. We must not look for much from them, for if we do, we shall most surely be disappointed. They do not have the patience to hear our complaints, or to understand the particulars of our case, or if anyone does have such great patience and so much tenderness as to hear our sad story, they will, it may be, sigh or shake their heads at it, but alas, they can give us no relief. Number five. Another end that God may have in the continuance of long and sore afflictions and great inward troubles is to reveal more clearly to us the corruption and defilement of our nature. In a calm, the waters of the sea appear to be clear enough, but when the storm comes, it throws up the mire and the dirt. In prosperity and health, we think we have very good hearts and considerable degrees of sanctification. But when sin is set home upon us, the spiritual law of God begins to show its purity. And oh, what multitudes of iniquities then appear! What unbelief, what impatience, what murmuring, what unbecoming thoughts of God, such hideous and strange thoughts as we have never had before. In times of health, strength, and peace, there are a thousand secular affairs and contrivances that take up our time and divert our minds, turning us to the view of things outside us. But in the trouble of our consciences, our eyes are turned another way to behold with attention our own souls, and to see what lusts, what impurities, what venomous creatures, what vipers have been entertained there. And oh, what a ghastly sight this is, to see such a numerous brood of transgressions, when we imagine that all had been very well with us. 
It is even a wonder that God, who saw so much evil in us, should let us alone so long. These spiritual afflictions show us what a sorry, contemptible creature man is, what cause he has to be debased when he is most proud, and what cause he has to be covered with shame and blushing when he is most fearless and undaunted. When God does not blow upon our garden, instead of those spices and graces coming forth that may be for his glory and for our comfort, there is nothing but weeds and thistles, nothing but thorns and briars to tear and wound us. Our soul is in like a dead carcass full of putrefaction, with no sprightly motions towards heaven, no spiritual desires, no warm desires. It is like the cold regions of the north, which the sun visits only with its fainter and weaker beams, and not like those eastern countries where its greater heat produces spices and fragrant flowers. Number 6. Another end that God has in the continuance of spiritual troubles and afflictions and the sense of his wrath long upon us is that from our experience, Christ may be forever very precious to us. When we are at ease and think ourselves whole, we seldom think of him. But our pain, our smart, our guilt, and our fears, the sight of our present danger and of approaching wrath, all cause us to run to this physician and beg his help when we are sinking. This will make us stretch out our hands and say, Master, save us, or else we perish. Never did a poor man beg for alms with more earnestness, and we shall beg his help. Never did a diseased person after a violent racking pain more long for rest and a cure than we shall long for Christ. Having fallen among lions, having been the slaves of fear, and having been held in captivity by the temptations of Satan, we shall most gladly shake off our chains and embrace liberty and salvation when our Lord comes to set us free. The sight of him as our Savior will make us run to meet him and say, Welcome, thou only friend of our souls. Welcome, thou dear physician and healer of our souls. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes to us in the name of the Lord. Oh, how our very hearts will melt with love when we remember that as we have been distressed for our sins against him. So he was in greater agonies for us. We have had gall and wormwood, but he tasted a more bitter cup. The anger of God has dried up our spirits, but he was scorched with a more flaming wrath. He was under violent pain in the garden and on the cross. Ineffable was the sorrow that he felt, being forsaken by his father, deserted by his disciples, affronted and reproached by his enemies, and under a curse for us. The sun was under a doleful eclipse. This living Lord was pleased to die, and in his death was under the frowns of an angry God. That face was then hidden from him that had always smiled before. His soul felt that horror and darkness which it had never felt before. Though there was no separation between the divine and the human nature, yet Christ suffered pains equal to those which we deserve to suffer in hell forever. God so suspended the efficacies of his grace that it displayed in that hour none of its force and virtue on him. He had no comfort from heaven, none from his angels, none from his friends, even in that sorrowful hour when he needed comfort most. Like a lion that is hurt in the forest, he roared and cried out, though there was no despair in him. And when he was forsaken, yet there was trust and hope in the words, My God, my God, have we been abandoned by God? He was much more so, and he was deserted for a while that we might not be so forever. Oh, how frequently should we remember such a Savior! How delightfully should we think and speak of him, who thought nothing too much to suffer for us! We have, by filling the wrath of God, drunk in some measure the cup whereof he drank. We do so justly for our sins, but he does so out of love and kindness, that he might make an atonement and a propitiation. And if what we have felt was so terrible, how much more dreadful was that which he endured! If the smaller drops that have put our souls into a flame have filled us with anguish, what torment did he undergo who was plunged into a sea of wrath? Surely such a friend, such a physician, as he has been to us, must be ever valued. We cannot pray but in his name. We cannot be justified but with his righteousness. We can hope for nothing but by his merits and his intercession. We cannot live, we cannot die without him. Let us be the constant language of our souls. None but Christ. None but Christ. Number seven. God also does this so that we put a high volume on the scriptures, that we may search and look into them with more earnestness and frequency, 
to see if there are any promises in them that are reviving and place in them that may afford hope and comfort to souls so miserable and so guilty. For when our consciences are awakened and pierced with a sense of wrath from God, if his word would speak peace to us, we could have ease, but the terrible threats thereof are the things that wound us deeply and put us to a greater smart. And we then know and fully believe beyond all doubt that this is the word by which we are to be tried in that great and solemn day. Number 8. Another end of God in continuing afflictions and a long remaining sense of his wrath upon us is that we may be everlasting admirers of the freeness of his grace when we are delivered. Oh, with what wonder should we behold his condescension and his care for us, that when our wounds were very deep, he poured in wine and oil. When we were inwardly bleeding and no creature or friend on earth could help us, he did not allow us to bleed to death. Whatever gifts we have, whatever advantage above some others in knowledge and in understanding, whatever opportunities we have of doing good, and whatever zeal we use in doing what that opportunity offers to us, we ought to say with Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.10, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. The hand of God is so strong and his wisdom is so admirable that he turns to our profit and advantage not only the evils which are caused by cross events or by the world, but those which we commit ourselves and that seem to be contrary to our salvation, even those sins which we are guilty of. He changes these poisons into medicine, these scandals into edification, and from the thickest darkness he brings out light. For example, by David's adultery and murder, he opened the eyes of his servant to consider the horror of his fault, and that which was likely to have thrust him into perdition instead, by divine providence, confirmed him in the way of salvation. By his fall, he was made to know how feeble his nature was, and on the other side, to know how admirable the grace of God was. This obliged him to quit all his opinion of himself and not to seek his happiness anywhere else than in the mercy and grace of God. As for other faithful persons, a sorrowful example of his was beneficial to mortify their vanity and pride, and to teach them to put all their trust in God. With what wonder should we daily cry out, Will God indeed dwell familiarly with men? Will he pity? Will he pardon such impatience, such murmuring, such unbelieving sinners as we have been? Will he cause us to hear the joyful voice again, who have so long had the voice of ruin and destruction in our ears? Will he return and be my God again, when I have so often thought that he was my enemy? Will he give me the hope of heaven when I have been so long at the very door of hell? Will he put out his hand and take me into his ark when my poor uneasy soul has been wandering to and fro, seeking rest and finding none? His end in these afflictions and sore trials is that the delivered Christian may be always employed in wondering at his love, and that when he has lost himself in wondering, transporting joy, he may say, Oh, the height, and breadth, and depth. Romans 11.33 What, will he be so gracious to me who has had such hard thoughts of him? Will he embrace me, such a prodigal as I am, in his arms? Oh, why should he let me live when others who have been less sinful than I are dead and have perished? Why should he be kind to me when I was so undutiful to him? What, will he give me leave to pray yet again to him when in my unbelief I so often said that it was in vain to pray? Will he allow me, who has spoken so unadvisedly with my lips, who has darkened counsel by words without knowledge, Job 38, 2, to take his name in my mouth? Will he suffer a mortal man and a vile sinner to say, My Lord and my God? Yes, he will. I see, I feel, that there is with him plenteous redemption. And I must forever admire the riches and the freeness of his grace. Let others talk of merit, of the power of their own will, of the light of their own understandings, and of the force and strength of their reason. As for me, I know that I have none of these things in which to boast. I was laid low in the very depths of misery and desolation, and there I would be laying still for all that I was able to do. I was helpless, and he filled my despairing soul with hope. I was very guilty, and he forgave me. I was near to hell. I saw the flames and smoke of that infernal pit. I smelled a fire and brimstone, and he alone 
who could help me, brought me back again. I was fainting and he revived me. I was dying and he made me live. How many has he passed by and allowed to pine away in their iniquities? And yet he said to me, Live. If he will accept my poor prayers, my weak endeavors, and my heart and my soul, my thoughts and my affections shall all be employed for him and for his glory. When I have so long heard the rumor and the noise of war, he has sent me the tidings of peace and joy. O oh, whence is it but from his own grace that I, who was so far from him, should be brought nigh, that I who hated him so much should be so greatly beloved? Enter into thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. Number 9. Another reason why God allows a servant so long to remain under the impressions of its wrath is that they may learn to be merciful and helpful to such as are in the same case, and as such as are sinning and have not yet felt the displeasure of God for their sins. First, as for such as are under trouble of conscience and the apprehension of God's wrath, as our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us, so we must be merciful to them. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, Luke 22, 32. And having met with a fountain that has quenched our thirst, we must lead them also to the spring of living waters. Think of yourself as a Joseph sold into the Egypt of a wounded conscience, where your feet were heard and the stocks and the irons entered into your soul, so that you might provide food for the famine of others and especially to be a purveyor of comfort to your brethren who shall follow you down into the same doleful condition. We must not grieve them by a sharp or unseasonable discourse. When they are in the furnace, we must not make it hotter by imprudent bitterness. They are wounded in their souls, and those wounds require a gentle, skillful, and tender hand. Every one of us should say they are troubled on every side, and so was I. They are afraid that God has departed, and so was I. Those arrows of the Almighty that stick in them only a little while ago stuck in me. That cup that is now in their hand was but a little while ago in mine. As they sigh and complain, groan and fear, even so did I. Therefore let me visit these sick, direct these wanderers who have lost their way, and see if these prisoners will become prisoners of hope by the sight of my liberty. I must lead them to my physician and tell them the nature of my cure. When others have fallen into the same pit that we have just gotten out of, let us strive to draw them up. Let us put on bowels of compassion. Let us patiently hear what they say and not rebuke them for complaining. Let us not be weary of their discourse because it is doleful and troublesome. Let us not smile at that which makes them weep, nor simply call that fancy which is the anguish and trouble of their souls. Let us remember all that speech and usage that made us worse when we were ill, and avoid all such with them. Let us remember what it was that gave us some support, and let us minister the same to them. When any of our friends are very sick, if we know anything that has been beneficial to us under the light case, we make all the speed we can to fetch it, and we cannot see them faint without finding at the same time a very sensible commotion in our own hearts. No outward affliction, though never so painful, is as terrible as these spiritual troubles are. Let us therefore be more affectionately concerned for such distressed persons than for any others when we see the anger of God beginning to kindle in their consciences. Let us use all the methods that are most likely to quench the beginning flame. For as God commanded the Israelites to be kind to strangers, because they themselves were such in the land of Egypt, so let us be very kind and pitiful to all who are in distress, since we have been so ourselves. Let us take all opportunities to visit, to exhort, and to direct them. Let us wrestle with the God of Jacob on their behalf. Let them see that we sympathize most heartily with them, and that though the grace of God has wiped away our tears, we can still weep with those who weep. Let us take all the ways we can to make them believe that we are afflicted with their affliction, and are sincerely concerned for the sadness of their case. And by this means they will ruminate on what we say, and will more regard what we tell them, since we have once been as they are now. Then they will also listen to others who may speak well indeed, but not from their own experience. If a man is diseased in his body, he would rather have a physician who had himself been lately cured of that disease, rather than someone who was more learned by information and study, 
but does not feel the disease half as much as a former one does. The knowledge of the one is but speculative, but the other is more distinct and practical. He knows how to make suitable applications to his patient from the remembrance how, it, how he felt in his own body. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Second, God continues the sense of his wrath very long upon the souls of his people so that they may learn to pity wicked men and instruct them in the way of happiness, Psalm 51, 11 to 13, that they might teach them by their words their serious exhortations, their faithful reproofs, their holy conversation, and every action that they go about. There are many lessons that we ourselves are not taught except by the rod and the frowns of an angry God by a very smarting and severe discipline. We do not see till after a long teaching the real evil of sin and the true worth of Christ, and we must communicate some measure of this knowledge to others, though the misery is that most will scarcely believe our report until they themselves have come to feel what we have felt. He who, by the mercy of God, has escaped out of long trouble of conscience can say this to sinners. I have dearly paid for all the delight that I once had in sin, for all my indifference and lukewarmness, for my cold and sluggish prayers, for my lost and poorly used time. Beware that you do not provoke him, for he is a jealous God. If you do, you shall also find that those sins which you make a slight manner of will tear you to pieces hereafter. You will find them when your consciences are awakened, to be a heavy and an intolerable burden. They will press you down into hell itself. I could not have imagined that the displeasure of God was a thing so bitter and so very dreadful. As the scripture says, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, for he is a consuming fire. If his anger is kindled but a little, you cannot then fix your minds upon any pleasant objects, nor have one easy thought. You cannot then go about your business, your trade, or your secular affairs, for your souls will be so much amazed that you will be full of horror and consternation. Those of us who have felt the terrors of the Lord most earnestly persuade you to forsake every sin, for if you indulge and love your iniquities, they will set you on fire round about. Oh, that you knew what you do when you sin! You are opposing that authority that will avenge itself of all its obstinate opposers. You are heaping up fuel for your own destruction. You are wetting that sword that will enter into your own bowels. You are preparing yourselves for bitterness and trouble. And though God is patient for a while, he will not always be so. The shadows of the night are drawn close, and the doleful time will come when all your mirth will end in tears, and all your false confidence and foolish hopes will expire and give up the ghost. And which of you will live when God shall enter into judgment with you? What will you do? Where will you go for help when he who is your maker, he who has weighed your actions and observed your wandering, shall call you to give an account of all these things? Our blessed Lord, when he came near Jerusalem, lifted up his voice and wept, saying, If thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, Luke 19.42, what cause have we then to mourn over our fellow creatures, whom we see to be in danger of misery, and alas, they do not know it? Can we see them sleeping on the very edge of ruin and not be troubled for them? O oh, poor sinners, you are now sleeping, but the judge is at the door. You are rolling a pleasant morsel under your tongue, but it will be a great vexation to you in the latter end. How can you rest? How can you be quiet when you have none of your sins pardoned, no comfortable relation to God, and no well-grounded hope of assurance? How can you with any assurance go about those things that concern your buying, your selling, and the present life, when your poor souls, that are of a thousand times more value, are neglected all the while? We have felt great tears, inexpressible sorrows from an angry God, and we would fain persuade you not to run upon the thick knobs on his shield, not to dare his justice, not to despise his threats as once it was our folly to do when we did not know what we were doing. We have come out of a great tribulation and a fiery furnace, and we would fain persuade you to avoid the like danger. Let what we have felt be a caution to you. It was the desire of the rich man, in his misery, to go to his brothers and warn them, lest they come to the same place of torment. But it was not granted. Some of us here have come from the very gates of hell to warn you, so that you may not go there. 
nay to warn you so that you may never go as near as we did. We wish you so well that we would not have any of you feel as much sorrow and grief as we have felt. We were once asleep as you are. We did not imagine that terror and desolation were so near. Then it came upon us, and now having been overtaken with the storm of wrath, we come to warn you that we see the clouds gathering, that there is a sound of much rain and of great misery, though your eyes are so fixed on things below that you do not see it. You must speedily arise and seek for a shelter. If you care about the salvation of your souls, you must not put off serious thoughts for your own safety, not for one day, not for one hour longer, lest it be too late. We were traveling with as little thought of danger as some of you, and we fell among thieves. They plundered us of our peace and our comfort, and we were ready to die when that God whose just displeasure brought us low was pleased to take pity on us and to send his son that kind Samaritan, to bind up our wounds and to cheer our hearts. And we cannot be so uncharitable as not to tell you, when we see you going the same way, that there are robbers on the road, and that if you do not either return or change your course, you will smart for your security as much as we have done. We have been saved indeed at length from our fears, though as by fire, but we suffered while they remained a very great loss." Someone might be saying to himself, I shall see no evil, though I walk in the imaginations of my own heart. These things you talk of are the mere product of a melancholy temper that always thinks the worst, that is always frightening itself and others with black and formidable ideas. And seeing that I am in no way inclined to that distemper, I need not fear any such perplexing thoughts. But know that no briskness of temper, no sanguine courageous hopes, No jollities nor diversions can fence you from the wrath of God. If you go on in sin, you must feel the bitterness of it, either in this world or in the next, and that you may come all of a sudden, notwithstanding all the strength of your constitution and all the pleasures of your unfearing youth, that cup that is full of sparkling wine has dregs and poison at the bottom. Your souls are always naked and open before God, and he can make terrible impressions of wrath there whenever he will, notwithstanding when by your cheerfulness and mirth you seem to be at the greatest distance from it. A reading from Trouble of Mind and the Disease of Melancholy by Timothy Rogers